Heavenly Father, we come into your presence once again as your entirely dependent children. We have no strength of our own, only that which you supply. And so we look to you for our daily bread, for our sanctification, for the improvement of our understanding of your word. We look to you for all things, O oh God. We pray that during this, these few minutes of teaching your word, that you would hide it in our hearts and change us as never before, bringing salvation to the lost and further knowledge of truth to your children. Be with us, O oh Lord, and be with the people in Ukraine and Russia. We pray, Father, for the believers in both those countries that you would strengthen them and give them much opportunity to share the gospel with those around them. We pray that you would subdue the evil in the hearts of evil men and that you would bring about that which would bring glory and honor to you. In Christ's name we pray, asking your blessing upon this hour. Amen. Our first scripture passage will be in the book of Exodus, chapter 11. I promised a couple of Sundays ago that we would talk about how the Passover relates to the Lord's Supper. And so today we fulfill that promise and I think uh, will bless our hearts as we consider these things. The Passover celebrated the last of the ten plagues God brought upon Egypt to end 400 years of slavery for some three million Jews. Working through Moses and Aaron, God commanded Pharaoh to let his people go. And you know the story. He refused again and again, and each time God sent a terrible plague to punish Egypt. He turned the Nile into blood. The fish died, and there was no water to drink. He covered the land and filled their homes with frogs. And then he turned the dust of the earth into gnats and then sent flies without number. And again Pharaoh refused to obey God. And so God killed their cattle and horses and donkeys and camels and flocks with disease and still Pharaoh would not give in. And so he covered the Egyptians with boils and destroyed their crops with hail and locusts and shrouded their land with impenetrable darkness. And then the account of the tenth and final plague begins in Exodus 11, 1, where I begin reading. Now the Lord said to Moses, One more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt, and after that he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. Verse 4, And Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I am going out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. From the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in the land of Egypt, such as there has not been uh, before, and such as shall never be again. Verse 7. But against any of the sons of Israel, a dog shall not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. And then if you look with me at chapter 12 and verse 1, we will see the rest of the story. Exodus 12, verse 1. Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, verse 3, Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Verse 6. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month, then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat. 
and they shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Verse 11. And now you shall eat in this manner with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. In other words, they were to be ready to leave Egypt. And you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgments. I am the Lord. And the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so every Egyptian household lost their firstborn child and the firstborn of their livestock that night. But the Jews, the Jews were spared because in obedience to God, they had killed a lamb and smeared its blood on the framework of their doors. And when God saw the blood, he passed by that household, allowing their children to live. When God saw the blood. He passed over them. The judgment of God did not light upon them. This is the event remembered when Jews celebrate the Passover even to this day. It commemorates the night that God made a clear distinction between Egypt and Israel by the blood of an animal lamb that represented and pointed to the Lamb of God who is Christ, our Passover. We are studying through the Old Testament on Wednesday nights and of course we're, we're working through some uh, trying uh, books of the Bible with all the, the lineage and, and the building of the tabernacle and all of that and we, we struggle sometimes to figure out uh, what's the point. But the point is it's all about Jesus. It all points to Jesus. It's all about Him. And so we're discovering all of these wonderful, difficult, hard to understand things. And we're discovering the truth that Jesus told the disciples on the road to Emmaus. Moses and the prophets wrote about me, Jesus says. And so... I take you to the Old Testament and the Exodus passage to introduce you to the first Passover where every Egyptian lost their firstborn but the Jews were spared because they obeyed the Lord and put the blood of a lamb on their doorposts. And so the Passover celebrations today, the one that we have seen in uh, John chapter 13 that uh, Jesus and his disciples are celebrating, it was about Uh, a commemoration of that moment in time. But as we come to the passage in John, we've been working through the 13th chapter, we're now done with that, Uh, but we get to witness the transformation of the Passover meal into the Lord's Supper, which celebrates Christ, our Passover. And we'll see more of that In a moment, Jesus, a Jew, had celebrated the Passover many times as a child and an adult. In Luke chapter 22, we find him and the apostles preparing to eat the Passover meal for the first time. If you'll look at that with me, the 22nd chapter of Luke's gospel, beginning with verse 14. Luke 22, 14. And I read, Luke 22, four, or excuse me, yes, 22 and verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him, and he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffered. You know from our previous studies that the crucifixion was about to take place the next day. Verse 16, For I say to you, I shall never again eat it, the Passover meal, until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. 
That is, until all that the Passover represented had, has been completely fulfilled by me. We need to understand that. He's talking about himself throughout. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God come. And so uh, Jesus identifies himself as the fulfillment of everything the Passover represented. It was an Old Testament thing. It was dark and mysterious. We, they didn't understand all that would, it was about. But Jesus comes to this moment in time and he declares, it was all about me and all the symbolism that was there is fulfilled in me. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup which is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. So you have the old covenant of the Old Testament, and now he's talking about a new covenant, a new and uh, fresh way or a... Uh, uh, a further revelation of how God deals with man by grace through faith. And so the lamb slain that night in Egypt and the blood applied to the doorposts of the Jewish homes represented Jesus and his redeeming blood. The animal lamb pointed to the lamb of God who now eats the Passover meal with his disciples and says, this is the last Passover I will eat because what this meal represents is fulfilled in me this day. 1 Corinthians 5, 7 declares this wonderful truth. The language is phenomenal. It says, for Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. If we were to be asked, what hope have you of heaven? Appropriate answer would be, why I have hope of heaven because Christ my Passover has been sacrificed. His blood has been shed and applied to the doorpost of my heart. And when judgment comes, it will pass over me. He bore my judgment, my condemnation. There is therefore now none for me to bear. Our Christ, our Passover, has been sacrificed. When judgment and punishment come upon this unbelieving world, that same punishment will pass over us because the blood of the Lamb has been applied to us by faith in Him. The blood of the Lamb in Exodus was effective, uh, effective physical protection for one night, but one night only. That's disturbing, isn't it? I have been saved by faith in Christ. I grew up in a world where they told me I had to be saved over and over and over and over again because I always sin again and again and again. But the Bible doesn't talk like that. That was an invention of men. The blood of the Lamb, the, the symbol that pointed to the reality who is Jesus, was effective physical protection for one night but one night only, while the blood of Christ secures our spiritual safety forever. Christ, the spotless Lamb of God, gave His life for us, was buried, rose from the dead, ascended into heaven, and now stands before God as our righteous substitute and advocate. Praise the Lord. Our Savior entered into the presence of God. Hebrews 9 and verse 12 says, not through the blood of goats and calves or of animal lambs, but through his own blood. He was the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. John pointed to him, didn't he? There, that man right there is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is what he was referring to. There was a physical lamb that night, but there is the lamb from God. The fulfillment of it all. Not through the blood of goats and calves did he enter into the presence of God, but through his own blood he entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption for all who believe in him. Amen. Everlasting redemption. Not thousand year salvation or million year salvation. It is eternal 
redemption. The blood of Christ has been applied to our hearts by faith. Jesus is our Passover lamb. And there is therefore now no condemnation. Or that is why I have confidence to stand in the judgment without being shuffled off to the fires that I deserve for my sin. Because Jesus bore my sin and imputed his righteousness to me. I am clean and justified by faith in my perfect Savior. I am not afraid of the judgment any longer. And so through the window of the inspired word of God, we now witness the Passover being transformed into the Lord's Supper. It's no longer a recollection of Israel's preservation, excuse me, preservation from death by the blood of an animal lamb. It's a remembrance of the sacrifice Jesus made on the cross for our salvation. Now look at Luke 22 and verse 19, please. Luke chapter 22 and verse 19. Twenty-two and nineteen. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is or represents my body which is given for you. This used to represent an animal lamb. It no longer represents an animal lamb. The blood of the lamb or the body of the lamb. It represents me. This is my body that we're talking about which is given for you. I'm about to give my life for you that you might live and never die. When the sun comes up, I won't see another day. This is the last day that I will be here with you like this. Of course, he'll rise from the dead, but he is saying, I'm about to die, and this represents my body, this little piece of bread. This supper is about me now. Do this from now on in remembrance of me. I am Christ, your Passover. We sing about the grace of God that saved a wretch like me. What do sinners deserve? Well, it's hell fire, that right now and that forever. But God sent his son to take that punishment in my stead. He's our substitute. You and I are no different we're not different than, than one another. You're a sinner, I'm a sinner. James says that if we've sinned in any way whatsoever, broken the law of God in any measure, we're guilty of it all. And here we are today, standing guilty before the holy God. But God, in all His holiness, saved us without violating His holy nature. He justified us by the sacrifice of His perfect Son, Jesus Christ. He reconciled us to Himself. He came in the person of Jesus, God in the flesh, to save us by the shedding of His blood from Himself. My goodness. Can I talk like that? That's bizarre, isn't it? But it's true, who was Jesus? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God who created all things, and He became flesh and dwelt among us. Behold, the Savior, His name is Jesus, and He is my God. It's wonderful. And when He had taken some bread and given thanks, He broke it. And gave it to them saying, this is or represents my body which is given for you. I'm about to give my life for you so that you might live and never die. This supper is about me now. Do this from now on in remembrance of me. I am Christ, your Passover lamb. And in the same way he took the cup after he had eaten, saying this cup which is poured out for you uh, is the new covenant in my blood. Now when we think of the old covenant, we, we think of the Ten Commandments, which in essence said, do this and live. If we just isolate it or, or boil it down to the ten, if we even boil it down to 
uh, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. Let's just do that. How are you doing with that? Can you be saved by keeping the law of love? No, because we do not love God appropriately. We do not love our neighbor appropriately. I might pull some of it off better than you, and, and you might pull some of it off better than I do. But the fact is, if you've broken one of God's laws, you've broken them all, and you need a Savior. Hell's in your future. You need a Savior. We think of the Old Covenant. We think of the Ten Commandments, which in essence said, do this and live, disobey and die. But the New Covenant is not about what God expects from us. Isn't that uh, wonderful? Do you understand that the gospel, the good news, is not about what God requires of us. The good news is about what God has done for sinners who can't help themselves at all. It's good news. It's not good news, folks, to tell me I have to do better. And better and better and better. No, no. The good news is there is one who was perfect in life and in death and he is your substitute and he says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden by trying to make yourself right with God. No, stop it. Put your tools down. Bring me nothing but what you got and that's just sin. Bring it to me and lay it down at my feet. That's pretty good news. <laughs> sweet, sweet news. Well, consider the words of Hebrews 8.10. I've got it printed for you, or you can turn in your Bibles, whichever you prefer. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. Hebrews 8 and verse 10. For this is the covenant. This is the new covenant. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. That is, with all believers in Christ. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds and I will write them on their hearts. And I will be their God. Not I might be or I hope to be. I will be their God and they shall be my people. I will make them my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me from the least to the greatest of them, for I will be merciful to their iniquities. Are you ready for the rest of it? And I will remember their sins no more. And what rushes into my mind is that horrible instruction from Jesus. Forgive as you've been forgiven. He tells us not to remember the sins. Our brothers and sisters and our wives and husbands sin against us. Forgive as you've been forgiven. Whoa. That's four-wheel drive country, isn't it? I will be merciful to their iniquities. Therefore you are to be merciful to their iniquities and remember their sins no more. I will remember your sins no more. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved from the wrath that was due you for sin. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will stand in the judgment and hear those joyous words. Enter in, thou good and faithful servant cleansed and washed and made righteous by the blood of my Son. Yeah. Under the new covenant, the law of God is written on the hearts of his people. In other words, a saved person has a new heart or mind. He is reborn, a born the second time. The Christian, because the Spirit dwells within him, knows instinctively when he or she has crossed the line from obedience to sin. Talked about it on Wednesday night, I believe. Uh, for some reason, I, I had the occasion to say, you people and me, we know exactly when we are going to cross the line. Because prior to that, the Spirit brings to mind the right thing to do, the right thing to say, hold your tongue, don't do that, don't go there, that's sinful, it won't be pleasing to the Lord. And we 
bow our backs and stiffen our necks and step out into a puddle of sin. You see, the Christian knows instinctively when he or she has crossed the line from obedience into sin because the Spirit of God and of Christ lives in them. He or she understands that they are to love the Lord God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength and their neighbor as themselves. And now, miracle of miracles, we want to do just that. Oh God, help me love you better. And more consistently, help me love my neighbor, my brother, my sister, more perfectly. We want to do it because along with the grace of salvation comes love for God and the brethren. When the Christian gives in to sin, he's immediately convicted, mourns and repents because he now loves God and cherishes his law. Under the new covenant, The sins of God's people are done away with forever. Christians gathered here this morning, I think we've already talked about this in the adult Sunday school class, but I'll ask you again. Have you all had a week wherein you look and feel like the Roman 7 man? I know what the law of God is. I love the law of God and I want to do it perfectly, but I don't always do so and it torments me to death. I I grieve, I mourn. Who will deliver me from the body of this death? And Paul says to the mourning believer who is overcome by the remaining wickedness of his own heart or the past sins that rush in upon him again, he is told that in the midst of it all there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because he satisfied the law on our behalf. He satisfied the law on our behalf. He is perfect in our place. If you're perfect, you don't belong here. If perfection is the requirement on the human level, I'll have to get Michael to come and preach for me. It won't work, will it? No perfection. No perfection. No. We have a perfect Savior. That's what makes us, that's what gives us hope of heaven. That's what, that's how He reconciles us to God. He gives us the perfections of His Son. He puts us in Christ. And we are in Him. His perfections are mine and my sin has been paid for by His suffering and I'm acceptable to God because Christ is acceptable to God. The thing is, if Christ ever decides to become a rebel, then I'll lose my salvation. But until the second person of the Trinity ceases to be holy in my stead, I am saved for eternity. He is my Redeemer. Yeah. Jesus says to the apostles, I am the Lamb of God. My blood is about to be poured out for you. It is my blood that will establish the new covenant. My blood will stay the wrath of God forever for those who believe. Jesus is our Passover Lamb, our Lord, our God, our everlasting Savior, Messiah. If we believe in Him, we will never die. There are three kinds of death in the Bible. We all experience physical death because we all sin in Adam and the soul that sins, it must die. That's why we all sin. People say, well, certain aspects of our society are not sinful. Well, uh, is there a portion of our society that does not die? If there is, then I will agree with you. If there is not the soul that sins, it must die and that's why we die. Because we all sinned in Adam. Then there is spiritual death, which describes what happened when we sinned in Adam. Sin separated us from God. That's why, as evangelistic uh, Christians, we need to beg people to be reconciled to God. We need to evangelize and call them to be reconciled to God because we have been separate from God because of sin. Therefore, when we come into this world, we are separate from God without hope or remedy if left to ourselves. We all like to be left alone. Just leave me alone. Can't wait to get out of this house so my mom and dad won't be sticking their nose in my business. I'd like to have them back. 
Those are pretty good noses. Therefore, when we come into this world, we're separate from God without hope or remedy if left to ourselves. Spiritual death is only reversed when we believe in the Christ of the Bible as our Savior and Lord. And in that moment, Christ's blood washes our sin and guilt away. In that moment, we are raised from spiritual death to life. We are reconciled to God by faith in Jesus. But then there's this third kind of death, which is making Spiritual death permanent, making separation from God last for eternity. It's called the second death. The third kind of death we must be aware of is the second death. Second death is defined as eternal separation in God forever, in, in he- from God in hell forever. This will be true of everyone who refuses to believe in and follow Jesus. We read about this sad, eternal state of the unbelieving in Revelation 20. <clears throat> now, you remember the text, I believe it's in Ephesians 2, where there's, this, there's this, this ugly list of sinful things that it begins with, the, the chapter begins with, and then it says, and such were some of you. So, make this, make this personal. Don't Don't waste your time by thinking of all the people this could apply to. Just remember, this was you if it's not now. You were a sinner in the hands of an angry God until Jesus put out the flames. Here we go. Revelation 20 and verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. He speaks of those who repent and cry out to Christ for salvation. These are raised from spiritual death to eternal life by faith in Jesus, the first resurrection, over such, that is, over sinners who believe in and follow the Lord Jesus, the second death has no power because by faith you've been reconciled to God. But they, those who believe in Jesus will be priests of God and of Christ and they will reign with Him for a thousand years. And then Revelation 21.8, going to bust our chops is what it's going to do. Listen. But as for the cowardly and the fatherless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars, oh, stop, please, stop! Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. I don't like this portrait of me. I don't like this painting that God has painted of of humanity. In our society, we're much, we have more couth than this. We we talk of, we talk of uh, love. It's like calling what used to be a garbage man a necessary element in our society. Now he's a sanitary engineer. Well, uh, what else do we do? Uh, we, we sanitize things so they feel better to us. The faithless, they're just people who choose, don't choose Christianity. Uh, they're detestable. Well, this is what I believe and this is what I do. They're murderers. Well, I just didn't need a child right now. It was inconvenient and so I had it taken out of my womb. I know what the Bible says about uh, sexuality, but uh, this, this is different. This is love. Or sorcerers and idolaters and all liars. Well, I don't lie big. I don't lie a lot. What does James say? When you've broken one of God's laws, you've broken them all. Don't, don't talk to us about, don't talk to me about little sins. Their portion will be in the lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Everlasting separation from God without remedy. Today is the day of salvation. Now is our opportunity while we live and breathe. Thus God makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel, just as he did in the book of Exodus. Egypt represents all unbelievers. Israel represents the people of God by faith in Christ. The fact is, unbelievers will be carried off to judgment. Believers are saved by faith in Jesus. This great divide is described in John chapter 3 and verse 18. John chapter 3 and verse 18. 
He that believeth on Jesus today, now, in this life, is not condemned. They will not be subject to the second death. They have been reconciled to God. But he that believeth not is condemned already. You see, I used to think that uh, uh, if I figured out that this Jesus thing was true, I would, I would save myself by giving in to Christ uh, uh, maybe uh, before I die, uh, but I've got a lot of wonderful things I want to experience before then. He that believeth on Jesus is not condemned. He's saved now and for eternity. But he that believeth not is condemned already. As I lived and breathed, I had on my, my favorite cowboy boots and, and I was in my 66 Mustang and surely was by my side both heathens. I'm out of dad's house, mom's house. I don't have to listen to that nonsense anymore. <laughs> Doing as we pleased. I was condemned already. I didn't need to die to be condemned. I was condemned already. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will not be condemned. Refuse. You're condemned already. You don't have to wait till you breathe your last. You're condemned right now. Because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Folks, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But praise God, Christ our sacrifice, uh, Christ our Passover has been sacrificed. Hallelujah. The lamb's been slain and the blood's been smeared on the doorpost of our soul. Trust in him and be saved. You see, Christians celebrate the Lord's Supper to remember the one who saved them by his blood and righteousness. We come to be reminded that we would have been destroyed like the Egyptian firstborn if not for the blood of the spotless lamb applied to our hearts by faith. Therefore, the Lord's Supper is a celebration of God's grace, his forgiveness of the freedom we now enjoy, freedom from the guilt and power of sin, freedom from the fear of death and judgment. Do you want to be saved? Well, if so, let me ask you this. What do you want to be saved from? The answer is almost always, I want to be saved from hell. Well, duh. Who doesn't? That's normal. If hell is real, nobody wants to go there. Nobody wants to go to hell. But the thing is, Jesus came to save us from our love of sin, from the guilt of sin, and from the power of sin, so that we could be reconciled to God and live for Him the remainder of our days. That's why He came. And He saves us from hell, too. Do you long to be saved from the practice and power of sin? Has God caused you to be disgusted with yourself, to know that you've sinned against the holy God and are do nothing but His wrath? Only Holy Spirit convicted sinners see their sin as so great, so black, so evil, that they have no hope of God's forgiveness unless they flee to the crucified and risen Savior who is Christ the Passover. The only difference between you, between me and an unbeliever, is that the blood of Christ, our Passover lamb, was applied to my heart. When in repentance I fled to Jesus, believing that he died for my sins, was buried and rose from the dead to reconcile me to God. And the same promise that he kept for me is also extended to you. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the command. And here's the promise. And you will be saved. Believe in Jesus, and you will be saved. Then you too will come to the Lord's Supper, where with gladness you will remember Christ your Passover, who has been sacrificed for you. It's a beautiful thing. You see, the gospel is not about straightening yourself up and make yourself right with God. That's impossible. The good news is that desperate sinners who have no hope and no strength, no hope of doing anything to change their own heart, can flee to Jesus with all their guilt, fall at his feet and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you died for my sins, was buried and rose from the dead. Save me for your sake. And he says, there will never be one who comes to me cast away from my presence. He'll receive everyone. Gentlemen, would you come to the table?
Father, thank you for this beautiful Lord's Day and all that has transpired. We thank you for your word, which is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword. We pray, Father, that it would pierce to the marrow of our, of our spiritual bones, granting us repentance and faith, an increase of faith and of knowledge and of sanctification, an increase of comfort and realization that our acceptance with you is not by works, but by faith, by grace through faith in Jesus. We thank you for the Lord's Supper and we understand that there is no redemption in the cup or in the bread, but there is plenteous redemption in Jesus, who it all represents. And we thank you for it. In Christ's name, amen. And so out of kindness and love, eternal love, perfect love, the Lord Jesus gives his disciples and us this wonderful reminder of why we have hope of heaven. It's not because of baptism. No magic in the substances. It's because Jesus died. He is our Passover lamb. And judgment's coming, but he promises when I see the blood, I will pass. I will pass over you. Let's eat and drink in remembrance of him. Brother Brian, would you cue the last hymn for us? It's the hymn, Jesus Paid It All. It'll be on the screen for you. If you happen to, if it's too small for you to see the page numbers in your bulletin.
just a, a few words. Uh, um, Shirley and I are going to be out of town on Tuesday and Wednesday. Uh, talk to Steve about the Tuesday Bible study. He'll tell you if they're going to meet or not. I think they probably will, because we're not indispensable. Uh, and Michael will uh, teach on Wednesday and preach for the first time on Sunday. It'll be a delight to have him back where he belongs. Uh, let's stand together and ask the Lord to bless us as we leave. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your living word. We thank you for all that we have heard today. We thank you for the conviction that you have brought to bear upon us because of sin. We thank you for uh, convincing us that we may have had a, a portion of our faith correct or correcting us in our beliefs where we were in error. Whatever you have done for these people today in salvation or growth in grace, we thank you for it and give you all the praise and glory. I pray that you would go with each one of these, that you would cause us all to live to see our loved ones saved, and that you would cause us to be about your business, bringing glory and honor to you throughout the coming week. In Christ's name we pray, amen. God bless you all.